Welcome back as we continue to journey through Galatians. We are at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians is one of these crisis letters that Paul writes, and he's trying to grab hold of people to help them to understand the truth of the gospel. He's like a dog on a bone. He just keeps coming back to the truth, the truth, the truth, to be able to set people free. Remember, there's these Judaizers that have come in that said it's the gospel plus the law, gospel plus circumcision. So once again, Paul is trying to bring us back that justification, being right with God, comes only through faith. And so he is going to bring up in Galatians 3 the poster child for justification by faith, our father Abraham. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. I pray, Lord, as we dive into your word that it will become life to us, it will be transforming, and that you will guide us and show us all truth in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul in chapter 3 asks a lot of questions. Questions are powerful because they help us to figure out what we believe, how we think, and make us question and dig into this word to know why we believe what we believe. So I'm going to ask you some questions. Are you trying to live your Christian life on your own? Are you striving to be right with God? How are we all justified? Are we justified by the law or by faith? There's no striving when it comes to faith because it's a gift of God. But with the law, there's striving, there's no peace, and there's chaos. So we're going to talk today about justification. And I love that justification makes us right with God. It doesn't improve us. It doesn't decorate us. It doesn't patch us up. It just sets us in right relationship with God. So we're going to look at justification in chapter 3. Chapter 3 contrasts faith and law together. And the Spirit is actually introduced in this chapter because it's the Spirit that helps us to live that life together. So Galatians chapter 3, 1 through 5, it says, You foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want you to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now perfected by the flesh? So did you come to know Christ and receive the Spirit of God and become right with God, and now you're following the law because you're trying to strive to become justified? Paul was like, no. He says in verse 4, Do you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Remember that Christ did not die in vain. It says, Does he then who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the work of the law or by hearing of faith? So he was asking all these questions. He says, are you seeing miracles because of the law or because of the Spirit? Well, of course, because of the Spirit. The Spirit is doing those miracles. And who has bewitched you? Who has got you to believe this untruth? Paul turns now to help us with an example through Abraham. Now, at the time, back in Abraham's time, it, he was Abram, and then God changed his name to Abraham. Now, Abraham is known as though him who was reckoned by righteousness, by faith. And he is the father of all, Jews and Greeks, all of us. So Galatians 3, 6 through 9 says, even so Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And that's an Old Testament quote from Genesis. There be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Did you catch that? The gospel was preached all the way back in Genesis. God himself preached the gospel directly to Abraham back in Genesis, saying that all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. So Abraham was justified by faith, and all those who have faith are his sons, even the Gentiles. 
not only the Jews, but the Gentiles. God promised the Gentiles that they would be saved as far back as with Abraham. He preached the gospel to all nations, just like for God so loved the whole world that he sent his son. It is for all. So in Genesis 12, 3, it says that, and in all, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And in Genesis 15, 5 through 6, he took him outside, showed him the stars in the sky, and said, your descendants shall be many. And he believed in the Lord, and it was reckoned to him as righteous. At that moment, when he believed in God, in the seed that he was going to send, which was Jesus, it was reckoned to him as righteous. He was made right with God. It was through his faith. And at that moment, God made a promise through a covenant. And with a covenant, there is shedding of blood. So two an the animals were brought. Abraham cut them in half and laid them in a row. And how you sealed this covenant was that the two that was making this covenant would walk through the dead carcasses, the blood, and seal this promise or this covenant. But God caused Abraham to fall asleep, and God walked through. Remember the fiery pot? God walked through and made this covenant because he knew God's people, Abraham, God's people could not complete the covenant, that it was going to be God alone that could reckon us right with him, make us right with him through this promise. So God promised that. And now it says in Romans, and if you ever want to get a much more doctrine on justification by faith, Paul wrote Romans. And Romans has a lot of chapters, and he explains a lot about how we are justified by faith in Christ alone. It's a great book if you want to read some more about it. But in Romans 4, it says in 9, says that faith was create, credited to Abraham as righteousness, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised, when was it credited to him? Well, in Genesis 12, when this promise was made to Abraham, he was not circumcised. He was made righteous by faith in an uncircumcised state. And it goes on, and it says in verse 12, And the father of circumcision to those who not are only of the circumcision, but who also fall in the steps of faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So he was not circumcised when this covenant was made, when this promise, and when he was reckoned as righteous and made right before the Lord by faith. Circumcision came in Genesis 17. And then on top of that, the law, which these Judaizers were trying to convince these Gen this Galatians that they needed to follow, came 430 years after this promise, after this covenant. So the law wasn't even around when Abraham was justified by faith. So the righteous by faith didn't come by keeping the law, but by faith. So Paul goes on to reason in Galatians 3, 10 through 14. It says, For as many as are the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. See, there's the curse. Because we are in bondage, we are in chains to this law. Because this law, the consequence for breaking the law, is sin and death. And if we remember all sin and fall short of the glory of God, so we have the curse of death. So there is this curse that comes through the law. Now in verse 11 of chapter 3, Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by what? Faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. 
in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So no one is justified by the law. Abraham wasn't, and no was any, nobody else was either. Abraham didn't even have the law. And in Galatians 3.11, Habakkuk 2.4 is the scripture that's quoted there that says that the just shall live by faith. Just a quick little note that I just love is uh, Martin Luther, he actually was walking on the steps of Rome during, right before the Reformation, which was the beginning of this justification by faith. And this scripture, Galatians 3.11, is what went through his mind and that he finally at that moment as he was walking the steps realized that faith came not through works but the faith is what makes us justified and right before the Lord. That it's not by works because they would flog themselves. They would try to work away to become righteous by trying to get their flesh aligned with the truth. And he finally, in this verse that Paul wrote, Galatians 3.11, realized justification came by faith alone. Then it goes on that the law was a curse. And so in order for that curse to be totally gotten rid of, Jesus Christ came. Because remember in James 2.10, it says, For whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles in just one point, he is guilty of them all. So there is no way we could keep the law, so we had Jesus who took that curse for us. I think it's so important that we recognize that Paul used the Old Testament in this New Testament passage. So from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we see the grace of God, that it's always been the gospel. That it has not changed. We always say, well, the Old Testament is the law and the New Testament is grace. No, may that not be. We can see that the promise that was made to Abraham and how he was reckoned by justice, by faith in Christ, made him right with Christ, came in Genesis 12, which was the grace of God. So True believers receive this spirit through the faith in Christ. In his death, remember, we died with Christ and we rose to new life with him. And so we are justified by faith, we live by faith, and we continue by faith because he lives where? In us now. There is nothing that we do that can justify us. We shall live by faith alone. So the question is, what does it mean to live by faith? How do we live by faith? And where does it begin? This made me think, is it in our doing? Because we're always striving to do to make us right with God. Or is it in our thinking? Well, I need to be reminded of Proverbs 23, 7. It says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's why it's so important that we know the truth. Because what we think here goes to our heart, and then we live it out. So these Judaizers were getting into the Galatians' mind saying, this is what will make you right. This is what you need to do. This is truth. And then they were going to live that out. That's why it's so important that we sup and eat and know this word from beginning to end and realize that the same gospel was at the beginning as it is in the end and that we are saved and justified by faith alone. In Christ alone. And there's nothing that we can do to make us in that right standing. And Paul keeps hitting them with this. And hitting them with this. Because the Galatians were being led astray from the truth. Beware. Do not be led astray. Make sure it lines up with the word of God. So he goes on and he says in Galatians 3, 16 through 18. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, singular. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one. And to your seed, that is Christ. What I am saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, remember we talked about that, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. Right here he's saying, look. That covenant that was given to Abraham and he was reckoned as righteous through his faith, the law does not nullify. The law does not contradict that. That covenant, that promise 
is ultimate. It came before. For if the inheritance is based on the law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. This was a promise Abraham believed in Jesus, that seed to come. He believed in God and it was reckoned to him. So then, why the law? 430 years later, why the law? Paul answers us in Galatians 3, 19 through 22. He says, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, sins, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now, a mediator is not for one who party only, for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? May it never be. The law cannot be contrary. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. But the scriptures has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ may be given to those who believe. It's the promise of the faith in Jesus Christ. So why was the law given? For sin. It was given because of transgressions. In Romans 3.20, it talks about that the law comes through the knowledge of sin. The law magnified and points us to sin. It makes us recognize that we are sinners, that there's no way that we can keep the law, and that the consequence of not keeping the law is a curse, which is death, which is separation from God. So it points us to recognize that we need a Savior. We need the seed. We need Jesus to break that curse and to justify us, to make us right with God. So the law, I want to talk about four things. God's law is right and the things that we need to know about the law. One, that the law was in in effect, was not in, sorry, the law was in effect until the seed came. The law was in effect until the seed came. But Jesus, he fulfilled that law. The law is not contrary to God's previous promise that he gave to Abraham, the gospel. God gave Abraham the gospel, and then came the law. The law does not nullify that. And the law does not give life. It cannot impart life. Only faith can do that. And as a result of the law, all of us are under sin. All of us fall short of the glory of God. So we need the Savior to redeem us from that, to break that curse of death. And so, as one man sinned, and other gives us freedom and makes us right with Christ. So, another, this chapter is full of lots of questions. One question is, what was the purpose of the law? We said, why would we have the laws to show us sin? But what was the purpose? And that's what Paul talks about at the conclusion of chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. It says, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself in Christ. This is key. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. The purpose of the law, it was a tutor to lead us to Christ. The law was to lead us to Christ. I love how it says, for all of you were baptized into Christ, having clothed yourself with Christ. That means that the Spirit came when we believed, and it is clothing us. It is clothing us in Christ. I love, when I was younger, I had gone to a private school, and we had a uniform, and sometimes all of the private school would come together for a function. And you could tell who and which place you belonged because of the uniform. 
Well, what is powerful is that when we accept Christ, we are now clothed with Christ. We are in Christ. So we are now one together in him. I love that we can grab each other's hands and seek the Lord during this time, even though we can't touch each other, but through prayer that that power of the Holy Spirit can bring us victory through this crisis of this virus, that we can have victory in Jesus knowing that he is walking us through this valley and he is carrying us and he's holding us in the palms of his hands. This is a promise that we are clothed in him and we all clothed in him. We are no longer Greek or Jew, male or female, slave or free. We are just one in Christ. That is powerful, so powerful. So he came and that we have faith in him. We are not under the law any longer. We are all believers in Christ and we are made right by his death and resurrection. Romans 5, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Do you have peace with God? You need to have peace because you've been justified, made right with God comes peace. Remember Paul at the beginning of the chapter says grace and peace. It goes hand in hand. You have grace in your life which brings peace with God. And it says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exalt in hope of the glory of God. We exalt in hope what happened when I came to that saving knowledge of Christ? I moved in to the grace of God. I sit now in the grace of God. I am now anchored here and recognizing that his grace is sufficient for everything in my life. And because I stand here, I can't be moved. It says, nor death, nor life, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. We are maintained by that faith. We live in that grace, and we remember that it is a gift of God that no one can boast. It is nothing that we have done, nothing that we can do. We need to not be striving as these Galatians were getting off course and recognize it's Christ and Christ alone. So he declares us righteous through Jesus Christ. Law magnified the sin which led us to the Savior, which then gave us justification to be right with God through his death and resurrection. This is so powerful. We need to constantly be reminded of that because we get so busy in life. We just try to keep afloat sometimes, and we don't get connected to this word. From the beginning to the end, it's the gospel, and it helps us to recognize and remember that justification, us being right with Christ, came through him. And we need to be connected because we live by every breath, every word of God that comes out of the mouth of God, and that is this living word. Just keep digging, keep striving in knowing the word and knowing him, not striving in trying to be and make yourself righteous, but striving in growing your relationship and knowing him. Because all striving is done. Christ paid and did it all so that we are made right. You know, when, when I give birth, gave birth to my kids, they were, my, they were children. Was there anything more that that baby could do to be a baby? No. And that's the same for us. It's the same for us. We were bought with a price because a debt had to be paid, and Christ paid it in full, that perfect sacrificial lamb. So just we need to stop and embrace Jesus because we are a child of God. And I love that Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I'm God. And I cannot end this without bringing up the song in Christ alone. This is the truth of what Paul was trying to tell them. It says, In Christ alone who took on flesh fullness of God and helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross... As Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ we live. There in the ground his body laid. This is the resurrection part. Light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost his grip on me. 
for I am his and he is mine through bought by the precious blood of Christ. So there's no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands our destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck us from his hand till he returns or calls us home. Here in the power of Christ, we stand, stand in the power. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word and your spirit that is life, that that resurrection power lives within each one of us, Father. Thank you that you conquered sin and death and gave us freedom. May we continue to just rest in knowing that we are whole in you, that you reckoned us by faith to be right with you. May we remember that spirit that raised Jesus from the dead resides in us and that we are now one. May we walk forth as one because we are a child of God and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.